Welcome to the ICD-10 CM updates for 2024. These are going to take effect October 1st of 2023. I'm Victoria Moll. I'm a medical coder, auditor, educator, and content creator. I have lots of free resources available on my YouTube channel. And today we're going to be going over ICD-10 CM updates. First and foremost, of course, I want to issue my disclaimer. Thanks for coming to the presentation. Before we dive in, please understand that everything is as accurate as I can make it at the time of this broadcast. That doesn't mean there aren't errors in it. Uh, there very well could be some little tiny ma minor errors. Um, and please make sure that you check with your contractors and things like scope of practice before taking any guidelines directly from Victoria. Now, Compared to last year, we did not see as many ICD-10 CM updates. So this year we have 395 new codes, uh, 22 were revised, and then we also had 25 that you may see re uh, reflected as deleted codes, but I say that they are more accurately converted to parent codes. The codes themselves were expanded, so they need additional characters. So they weren't deleted out like ineffective per se. It's just that they need an additional character now. Um, because there was only a handful of the ones that were converted to parent and the ones that were revised, I'm going to save those for our last couple of slides. And I'm going to go through just chapter by chapter. Last year, we actually saw 1,176 new codes and 251 deleted and 36 converted to parent. So compared to last year, these changes aren't as significant. So thankfully, I'm here to not give an hour-long presentation on this. I'm going to give some clarity on the revisions, but I'm not going to make you brain dead going through all of the updates. So first, I'd like to start out with the guideline changes. Uh, we're not going to go over any little things that are like grammatical errors or little tiny minor revisions that aren't going to change the actual context of the guideline that we're looking at, okay? So um, there was a change to the documentation by clinicians other than the patient's provider. So in our previous roles, we've seen that uh, people other than the patient's provider are allowed to document certain things um, in the patient's record and we can abstract those codes, such as BMI or if a wound care nurse documents the stage of a pressure ulcer. Well, there's been a little minor clarification now in regards to social determinants of health. And we have seen some changes to SDOH this year. Uh, so the SDOH that can be documented by someone other than the patient's provider. One of those exceptions, uh, it now clarifies that they have to be classified to chapter 21. So it's something that a lot of us have already assumed that when they said social determinants of health, they meant the codes that were in chapter 21, um, but now it is outlined specifically in the guidelines. The guidelines for chapter one were slightly changed. So it says that if a patient has sepsis, that's following a post-procedural wound. We would use a T code. If they're an OB patient, of course, we would use those O codes. Those take precedence over everything else. Um, and the OB code, of course, gets sequenced first. And then we would assign an additional code for sepsis following a procedure, which is the T1.44, or sepsis following an OB procedure, O86.04. There is a new guideline in regards to screening for COVID-19, and it says that for screening for COVID-19, including preoperative testing, so a patient that maybe is going in for some kind of surgery and we want to make sure that they don't have COVID before we send them into the hospital for surgery, we would assign code Z11.52 for encounter for screening for COVID-19. Chapter nine has been revised in the guidelines. There is now a new code for resistant hypertension, which we'll talk about when we get to our eye codes. So resistant hypertension is when a patient's blood pressure stays high even after they're taking medications. So if you see this condition, you'll use the code I1A.0. Um, but remember, it this is an extra code, so we always have to have the specific type of the existing hypertension first, and then use the I1A.0 for the resistant hypertension. 
There was also some additions to some of the coma guidelines. So uh, this clarification on the coma scale says that if we know the coma scale or the patient is in a medically induced coma or sedated state, we should not be using the unspecified code. So that R40.20 is only for when the cause isn't known or the code uh, is traumatic brain injury. We don't have the coma scale documented. Now, this clarification to our guideline states that we should not use the coma scale codes when the patient has a non-traumatic coma due to an underlying condition. So if you are using R40.2a, do not use the coma scale codes. And then we have some codes in regards to follow-up. So the codes are all about, you know, keeping tabs on the patients after they've finished treatment. So if someone is done with their cancer treatment, we will use a code from Z08. Uh, if it's encounter for other conditions, for other follow-up examination after they've completed treatments for conditions other than cancer, we will use our Z09 codes. Now let's get into our code changes. Starting with chapter one, we have two new codes here, uh, A41.54 and B96.83. So these are for um, different types of infections, bacterial infections, and the bacteria infections are kind of everywhere. They're like in the soil, they're in the water, and it's a big deal because it can infect different parts of your body from your blood to your lungs. Sometimes it just exists in your system without causing harm. But when it's resistant to antibiotics, uh, it can be problematic. So that was like our, uh, what they call carbapenem. And in 2017, this caused around 8,500 infections and 700 deaths in U.S. hospitals. We added code D13.91 for familial adenomas polyposis. This is a genetic condition that makes you prone to colon cancer and lots of colon polyps. There are three types. There's classic, there's annotated, and there is autosomal recessive. So the first two types are caused by mutations in the APC gene, while the last one is due to mutations in the MUTYH gene. Um, if you're looking at the classic version, that is hundreds to thousands of polyps. They usually start in the teen years. And without surgery, those polyps can turn cancerous on average by like age 39. Um, it, the annotated is a little bit slower. Cancer usually shows up around uh, age 55. The autosomal is the less aggressive version. You'll see fewer than 100 polyps, and it's usually the less severe version. So why is this important, right? Uh, because these mutations mess with the cell growth, they can lead to all kinds of different polyps that potentially lead to cancer. So we'll see these new status codes when we get into our family history codes and our new status codes as well. Um, and we also added some codes for um, benign neoplasm of ill-defined sites within the digestive system, so D13.99. And the desmoid tumors you'll see over here, that's a lot of the different types here. I'll circle them. These desmoid tumors we have broken down then by the area in which they are located and then of course the unspecified code. Chapter three expanded for a lot of codes with sickle cell thalassemia. So um, when we have sickle cell hemoglobin that causes the red blood cells to become sickle shaped under stress. Uh, like low oxygen, and these sickle cells can block blood vessels and cause pain and other complications. And then the beta thalassemia, that leads to reduced production of normal hemoglobin, and it can result in anemia. So when we mix those two together, we get the sickle cell thalassemia, and that is a condition that has features of both. Uh, the severity can vary depending on the type. Um, if you have beta zero, that's where no normal hemoglobin is produced and the condition is more severe. If it's beta plus, there is some normal hemoglobin produced and the symptoms might be milder. Um, we also have the schwammann diamond syndrome, which is a rare genetic disorder affecting the bone marrow, pancreas, and skeleton. And it leads to a weakened immune system and makes you prone to infections, um, as well as it gives uh, issues to pancreatic enzymes. Plus it often, often comes with skeletal abnormalities like short stature. 
And then we have this IG4 related disease, I'm sorry, IgG4 related disease. And that is a complex issue. It affects multiple parts of the body. It's an immune mediated condition characterized by tissue inflammation and elevated levels of uh, certain antibodies, specifically the IgG4. And this disease can target almost any organ, pancreas, liver, kidneys, lungs, any symptoms vary based on the affected area, but often include things like swelling, nodules, and even organ dysfunction. We had a fair amount of codes added this year to chapter four, so our endocrine, nutritional, metabolic diseases. Um, we have here codes for the autosomal dominant hypocalcemia, which is a genetic disorder affecting calcium metabolism. Um, and the ADH comes in two types and caused by mutations in either the CASR or GNA11 genes. And it leads to the body misinterpreting how low calcium levels are. This can result in a range of symptoms that affect the muscles, the nervous system, and the kidneys. And the diagnosis is confirmed through genetic testing and treatments focused on calcium and vitamin D supplementation. But the treatment is kind of a balancing act because excessive calcium can lead to kidney issues. So the new codes aim to improve the tracking and treatment of ADH and other types of hypoparathyroidism, like those associated with cancer or uh, autoimmune conditions. The Global Leukodystrophy Alliance proposed to have new codes created for the different types of leukodystrophies. Leukodystrophies are rare diseases that affect the brain's white matter, and they can be very serious, even fatal, especially for young kids. Right now, we've only had codes added for these six main types, but experts know there's a lot more. There's over 400, and they are better reflected in ICD-11, which is still a ways off. Um, and each of them have their own genetic cause and symptoms, and of course, different ways that we test for them and potential treatments. So having unique codes for each of these types will really help better with the research and the patient care. And then you'll see here, we also saw a new code this year for metabolic syndrome, which I thought we had a code for, but apparently not. Metabolic syndrome, of course, includes different factors like high blood pressure, high blood sugar, uh, excess fat around the abdomen, and uh, abnormal cholesterol levels. So that's what we consider metabolic syndrome. We have a few new codes to specify types of insulin resistance. And then we have down here our wasting disease. Uh, wasting disease is when a person loses more than 10% of their body weight and muscle mass, which is usually due to an underlying chronic disease. And it can be a sign that the disease has reached a severe level. So the National Center for Health Statistics requested a code specific for wasting disease. There were no changes to our chapter five codes for this year. Now, as far as chapter six, continuing the need for our leukodystrophy codes um, that we saw in some of those e-codes, we have added some for the types of leukodystrophy that impact the nervous system. So Parkinson's disease has been expanded for with or without dyskinesia. Uh, dyskinesia is an involuntary erratic movement of the muscle. Hypomyelination with atrophy of the basal ganglia and cerebellum is a rare neurological disorder that affects the central nervous system. And now that's assigned to our G23.3 code. Um, Lafora progressive myoclonus epilepsy is a rare inherited neurological disorder that's characterized by the onset of seizures and progressive neurological decline. It's one of the most severe forms of epilepsy. And then there was a request from the Wisconsin Physicians Service Corporation for a new ICD-10-CM code specifically for chronic migraine with aura. Chronic migraine is defined as a headache occurring 15 or more days a month over a three month period with at least eight days a month having migraine features. Uh, these new codes kind of aim at having more coding specificity for the treatment and research of those individuals that are suffering, suffering from chronic migraines with aura. In our chapter seven codes, we had the American Academy of Ophthalmology propose new codes for proliferative sickle cell retinopathy, which is a condition that can lead to vision impairment and blindness. And then we have a new section of codes here regarding muscle entrapment. Extraocular muscle entrapment is a condition more common in pediatric trauma. It is rare in adults, 
but the condition can lead to severe symptoms like bradycardia, nausea, even syncope. So the American Academy of Ophthalmology and the American Association of Oral and Maxofacial Surgeons supported the proposal for these new codes. The aim is to provide uh, you know, better research for treatment, especially since the condition requires pretty urgent intervention to prevent muscle necrosis. And the proposal recommends adding unspecified to the subcategory of H50.68 for more accurate coding. And then we saw some code additions here for low vision of the right eye category two and foreign body sensation of the eye. We'll see more and we'll talk more about the foreign body codes when we get a little further in. By the way, if you are getting value from this presentation and I also saved you a ton of money from hiring a very expensive consultant or having to buy a very expensive webinar to share with your entire department, or I just saved you some money out of pocket, you can thank me with a super thanks. If you want to just drop me five, ten dollars $10, I will greatly appreciate it. It will help support me and the channel and continuing offering these great resources to others. There were no changes to our chapter eight codes. We did see 10 new codes added to chapter nine. IA.0 is that code for resistant hypertension that we talked about when we talked about our guideline changes. Uh, and that is that form of high blood pressure that remains even when we have tried at least three antihypertensive medications from different classes. Usually that includes a diuretic. After that, we have some new codes in regards to coronary microvascular dysfunction, which affects this microvasculature, leading to a range of symptoms from angina to heart failure. The 2021 guideline for evaluation and diagnosis of chest pain recommends specific tests for diagnosing CMD as it's associated with higher risks of major cardiac events. So Abbott Laboratories proposed these specific codes to improve the diagnosis and treatment. There was a modification to the code title for inappropriate sinus tachycardia by adding this little tiny statement here that says, so stated. So the code changed from I-47.1 to I-47.11. So make sure that you're updating all of your quick pick lists and uh, super bills or whatever you might have out there to notate that there is an additional digit there and a slight change that it has that word so stated at the end. Uh, and of course, I-47.19 was added for other SV tachycardia, there is, of course, the unspecified code if the provider only states SV tachycardia. In 2017, carbapenem resistant Cinebotteri led to an estimated 8,500 infections and 700 deaths in the U.S. based on an internal CDC review. So we have new codes in Chapter 10 to reflect this. We also have some additions to the bronchitis and COPD codes, including and other specified COPD codes. So you'll see that right here, J44.89, other specified COPD. And then some allograft-related lung illnesses were added, J4A.0, restrictive allograft syndrome, J4A.8, other chronic lung allograft dysfunction, and then J4A.9, which is chronic lung allograft dysfunction, dysfunction unspecified. We added a pretty good amount of digestive system codes this year. You can see acute appendicitis with generalized peritonitis added some codes for with or without abscess and in regards to the perforation. Then we have this small intestinal bacterial overgrowth section. Gut overgrowth conditions can lead to symptoms ranging from abdominal pain to bloating. Diagnosis typically involves breath tests or intestinal samples. And treatment options include targeted antibiotics or antifungals. And these conditions are a growing concern for patient quality of life. We also added some retroperitoneal codes, retroperitoneal fibrosis and retroperitoneal hematoma. We have new codes for short bowel syndrome with or without colon in continuity and an unspecified one. And then one code added for intestinal failure. There were no changes to chapter 12. We did see a few codes expanded in chapter 13 in regards to orthopedic procedures. So those autologous bone grafts often come from the pelvis. However, in patients with osteoporosis, this can lead to pathological fractures in the pelvis, which affects about 1% of cases. Current ICD-10-CM codes inaccurately categorize these as femur fractures, which makes 
uh, some impacts on the clinical decision making. So the AHRQ proposed these new, more accurate codes that specifically say they are for age-related osteoporosis with a current pathological fracture of the pelvis to improve the diagnosis and treatment. And you can see here, I left the, the blank space here and the categories down here, of course, we have coordinating for A for the initial fracture, D for the subsequent, et cetera. In our chapter 14 codes, the Renal Physicians Association advocated for some new ICD-10 CM codes for immunoglobulin A nephropathy, which is a common kidney disease affecting young adults and can lead to end-stage renal disease. Uh, the adding of these codes for additional specificity allows for better patient care as the IGAN is diagnosed via renal biopsy and has specific therapies for treatment. We also added codes for a specification of different types and specifications of nephropathy. In our chapter 15 codes, which we all know take precedence over all other codes and need to be sweep against first, uh, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, ACOG, said that they needed some new codes for intrahepatic cholestasis in pregnancy, which is a liver disorder that affects about a half a percent of pregnancies in the U.S. And ICP poses risks to both the mother and the baby, including preeclampsia and preterm birth. So diagnosis is uh, through a bile acid blood test and treatment guidelines do exist for that. And the condition usually resolves post-pregnancy, but may indicate that there may be some future liver issues. Chapter 16, we saw no updates. Chapter 17, we saw a handful of updates for our congenital malformations, deformations, and abnormalities. So allergial syndrome is a genetic disorder with varying symptoms. It could be jaundice, poor weight gain, heart defects. Currently it's grouped under a broader liver malformation code. So they need this code to you know, improve patient care, clinical practice, patient education, research. Uh, and that was proposed by the Global Liver, Global Liver Institute. We added new specifications for craniocentosis. Craniocentosis is when the joints between a baby's skull bone close too early, and that affects the skull's shape and the brain growth. So treatment usually involves surgery to correct the skull shape and make room for the brain to grow. And then we have at the very bottom here, MED13L syndrome. So that's a genetic disorder affecting over a million people worldwide characterized by intellectual disability, heart defects, and low muscle tone. And the foundation pushed for a new code. The syndrome is managed through various therapies and a lot of ongoing surveillance, and there is currently no cure available. And then lastly, we also added in this chapter Q93.52 for Phelan McDermott syndrome, Q87.83 for Bardet Beetle syndrome, and Lawrence Moon syndrome. Now we added a lot of codes this year for specified foreign bodies entering through orifices, which we'll talk about in our external causes. But there's also some codes for when we have the sensation of having a foreign body, but it is not actually there. Like we go in, we look and we go, oh, we just, we thought it felt like a foreign body was there, but we didn't actually find anything. So instead of having no code or uh, the worried well diagnosis. Now we have specified diagnoses for those in our chapter 18, form body sensation, unspecified nose, throat, and other site. We also have a new non-traumatic coma code, which we kind of talked about in our guidelines. And there are several new codes for density of the breast because um, dense breasts can impact those mammogram readings. So now we have these combined codes that are saying the patient's coming in for a mammogram and specify that they have dense breasts and give some specific information. So that, that helps um, improve the data accuracy there as far as those screening codes. And of course, with the breast codes or any breast codes, we want to make sure that we're defining the laterality, right or left or bilateral. We have a few new codes for toxic effects of gadolinium, which is a chemical element that is used in different MRIs. It can cause side effects such as injection site discomfort, nausea, itching, rash, headaches, dizziness, but there are some more uncommon side effects like if you get nephrogenic system fibrosis. The biggest changes we saw this year were to chapter 20, which is our external cause codes. 
Now, one of my guilty pleasures is I like watching Lauren the Mortician on TikTok. She talks about death and dying and child safety and some things that she has seen in her years practicing as a mortician that have resulted in fatalities, specifically in children. Um, and that includes things like those water beads or aqua beads that expand and how problematic those can be when ingested by a child. And she also talks about things like magnets and those little button batteries. Now, button batteries can result in some rapid caustic tissue issues if they are ingested and both acute and chronic complications. Um, there was an analysis that uh, was of 8,648 battery ingestion cases. The majority of them, 8,161, were those button batteries. So those are accidentally getting ingested versus the cylindrical cells. Only 487 of those cases were those AA, AAA batteries. So um, a lot of the button battery injury cases, 62.5% are in children, but we also see a good percentage of them, 15.9, are in the elderly, elderly pe people over 60 years old. So there was an expansion of a lot of the codes of um, things that can be entered into natural orifices. Of course, it was the American Academy of Pediatrics that really pushed for this because they're seeing the majority of it. Little kids under six sticking metal objects, magnets, pieces of plastic toys and jewelry and so forth uh, into their into their ears and, and nose and mouth and so forth. So you see, we have different types of objects here that can be inserted or entered into through a natural orifice, batteries, plastic coins, plastic beads, jewelry, bottle, glass, magnetic metal objects, metal jewelry, and then it even continues into the next page, um, non-magnetic metal beads, metal toys, uh, bezoar, which is um, like a, a clump of hair or natural fiber, and then we have food, rubber bands, insects, non-organic uh, items, uh, audio device, so like your earbuds, right? Combinations of metal and plastic items, needles, and then knife, sword, or dagger entering in through a natural orifice. We have a lot of new codes too in chapter 21, starting with encounter for a child welfare exam, observation and evaluation of newborns for suspected conditions that were ruled out, and Z16.13 is the resistance to carbapenem that we talked about. So carbapenem is that class of antibiotics that are often used as a last resort to treat those bacterial infections that are resistant to other antibiotics. And there is a rise of carbapenem resistant bacteria in healthcare that are, are of a growing concern. We can see here in these new Z22 codes that they are for the status of someone who is a carrier of these uh, resistant bacteria. We also have some new codes for encounter for HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis, encounter for other prophylactic measures, and then we start getting into the new SDOH codes, so child in custody of non-parental relative, child in custody of non-relative guardian. We have a lot of new SDOH codes this year in regards to child, guardian, and caretaker relationships, as well as a new code for a patient being a runaway from their current living environment here, which is our Z62.892 code. And then we also have some new family history codes for uh, colon polyps. So history of hyperplastic colon polyps, other family history, family history of colon polyps unspecified. And uh, we also have this new Z91.85 code, which is a status for a patient with a personal history of military service. There were no changes made to chapter 22. And that's it for code additions. Let's get into the revisions. Isn't it great that I didn't waste $100 of your money and an hour of your time to go over these? Fantastic, right? Again, super thanks button right there. So these are the revised codes. You can see on the right-hand column is the old description. Left-hand column is the new description. A lot of them were very minor changes. So we have things like abdominal aorta is now thoracoabdominal aorta. And we have Marfan's syndrome converted to Marfan syndrome. So really these aren't significant. A lot of them were just very minor revision details. And of course, we had these 25 codes these year that weren't necessarily deleted, but they are now expanded. They now require an additional character to be a full code. And those new full codes should have been in the uh, new codes that we added there. 
So things like craniosyntosis we have con was converted to a parent code. It needs additional characters. Uh, other forms of angina pectoris, I2 0.8, that's going to need some additional characters there. Parkinson's disease has been expanded. So uh, metabolic syndrome and this insulin resistance, those codes were expanded and need additional characters. So again, these weren't necessarily deleted, but they were expanded. They will need additional characters now in order for them to pass through on a claim or so forth. So that's it for the ICD-10-CM updates for 2024. I'm actually going to drop my presentation in the video description. So if you are someone from a local chapter or someone that wants to give this presentation at your office, feel free to take it, adapt it. The only thing I ask is that you please not take my presentation and then use it to sell for personal benefit. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. I will see you in the next video. But until then, just keep on coding on.